There's so many false views of Christianity today. Um, and with those false views, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who, who look at ministers and pastors of those in the ministry in, in different ways. And uh, the Corinthians, as they were, Paul was writing to them, thought that pastors were big shots. They, they had this uh, kind of view of, of the, those who were in the ministry as being greater than themselves, uh, so much greater. And, and uh, you know, others see pastors as, as, as guys who, uh, or, or women that, that kind of like play around all week and then get to perform on Sunday, one hour a week, you know, those kind of things. Uh, but in these verses, Paul puts before us pro uh, proper responsibilities as pa of pastors, of ministers, and also of Christians, and also the proper evaluation of the ministry that we have as believers and the freedom that we as believers can exercise when we, when we look at it in the proper light. Verses 1 and 2 speak to us specifically about these responsibilities. And there are three responsibilities that we see in these verses. One, number one, is we are served to be servants of Christ. He starts off here saying, so men ought to regard us as servants of Christ. And if you look up the, the biblical text uh, in, in chapter 3, uh, verse 5, you'll find Paul describing himself as a servant. What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants is what he says. In the Greek language, that word there is diakonos. That's where we get the word deacon from. It's somebody who serves. Literally, it's somebody who serves tables. Okay? Uh, those who wait tables. Here, though, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, this is a different word that is used for servant. It's a richer term by parallel comparison. It's huperetero, okay, which comes from two words. It means under and rower, literally an under rower. Uh, it, that's the meaning of this word. Men ought to look at us as under rowers. Paul uses this term that would be familiar to the Corinthians. The Corinthians would, would see the, the warships of the Roman Empire sailing across the Corinthian Isthmus. And on these war galleys, the lowest deck was made of a single row of, uh, of rowers. There's, that's where the, the slaves would sit to row and move the ship. And their only job, were, their only responsibility was to listen to the captain. When the captain says, oars up, they put the oars up. When they said, oars down, they put the oars down. When he said, stroke, they stroke. That's what their job was, to listen to the command and to the beat of how fast to row. That was their only job. Their job was to just do what he said. The term huperato is, is used elsewhere in the New Testament to simply describe people who were functionaries, people who carried out orders. For example, Acts chapter, four, uh, Acts chapter 13, excuse me, verse 5, John Mark was taken by Paul and by Barnabas on their first missionary journey to be a under rower, simply Someone who did the chores that were assigned to them. Now, there's a temptation in the Christian life to call our own shots and to do what we want to do. The things that we, we like to do things the way that we want to do them. Sometimes it's like if, if, if we feel good about something, things are going great and, and, and you know, it's fantastic. If we don't feel good, we don't think that it's going that great. You know, if we feel good in a marriage relationship, everything's okay. If we don't feel good, you know, some people want to walk away. We live on the excuse, my past is what has made me. Therefore, how do you expect me to be different? 
We live on the everybody else is doing it kind of level, which justifies actions based upon how someone else is living. Or maybe even not living the Christian life. An under rower, though, is one who looks only <clears throat> looks to only one for their orders and instructions in life. The under rower is a person that marches by the cadence. In this instance, the cadence of God. Jesus said it very, very explicitly. He said, you have only one master. The job of every Christian is to occupy that lowly place of service and humility before God and take orders only from God. Amen. Are you all with me? The second thing he says, as well to the ministers of the word and the individual Christians, that we are stewards of the mysteries of God. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Though have, those who have been entrusted with the secret things of God, the literal, the, the literal is stewards of the mysteries of God. The word stewards is a, is a uh, King James type word, but it's a good translation. It means house distributor or dispenser. It's, it's someone who administers the affairs of another person or the, the household. It's the person that is, um, he, he administers somebody else's property, not his property, but somebody else's property. He marshals the equipment and supplies and directs the affairs of the household of the owner. So a steward or a stewardess of the mysteries of God is, is one who knows the riches that are in God and shares those riches, distributes those and dispenses them to the people in the body and in the world. This phrase, the mystery of God, the mysteries of God, is a well-worked term in the New Testament. There are several ways that the New Testament speaks of mysteries. We have, for example, Jesus talking about the mystery of the kingdom of God in Matthew chapter 13. Those who are Christians are, are, are those who know the mystery of the kingdom. You know, seeds are a mystery. We don't know what, what a potential a, a seed has, it, it, if it will become a cucumber or a radish or a beautiful flower or what. It's a mystery. If you don't see the package when you're planting seeds, it's, it's hard to detect what those seeds will become. In the same way, the kingdom, is a mystery, the kingdom of God is a mystery in the world. Their mystery is that people don't see that God's reign or rule or activities has invaded the world. It looks like so much evil is in control. How can we be sure that God has really come to us in the person of Jesus Christ? What do we mean when we say God is ruling and reigning in our life? It's a mystery because... It's not somehow political. It's not somehow outward. It's small. It's like a seed. The kingdom is, the kingdom is as a sower that went forth to sow seed. I'm, I'm able to know what this seed is because I've looked at what the outside package is. In the same way, when we have seen Christ and who he is, I don't have to personally experience the resurrection to know what is ahead for me. Because I've seen through Jesus Christ in the scripture, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, which is a mystery. People were wondering, what really? Is, is there really a God? Is he real? Can I know him? Here's the thing. Those of us who are in Christ already know that. It's not a mystery to us. We are stewards of that mystery. We tell how the mystery has been solved where it came from, and what we're doing here, and where we're going, we speak the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And there are plenty of mysteries in Scripture. There are the mystery of Christ in the Gospel in Ephesians chapter 3, that we as Gentiles are heirs with the Jews. There's the mystery of faith and godliness in 1 Timothy. There's the mystery of Israel in Romans chapter 11. Here's a nation that is still in existence. The Philistines are gone. 
The Jewish people are still here. It's a mystery. Why are they still here? What is God doing? The world doesn't know what the purposes of God's dealings with Israel are. But to us, it's not a mystery anymore. We dispense the mystery. We tell what it's all about. There's the mystery of lawless, lawlessness in the world. The terrible, the terrible crime and the evil that is in the world. We have a grasp because we know where it's coming from. Look, you can see on EN, uh, you can look at CNN, and, and you can see that they are perplexed by all the things that are happening in the world. How do we, eh, just what happened in Baltimore City this past week? What are we going to do? How do we fix this crime problem? How do we do this? Why or where is this coming from? And you can get you can get all kinds of of, of psychological and eco, uh, economic, social, uh, political answers, but the truth of the matter is, it's satanic in origin. Amen. The world can't see it. We too know the the mystery of the resurrection. Paul says. Behold, I show you a, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, in, uh, in the twinkling of an eye, for the trump of God shall sound, and Christ shall descend. There's going to be a resurrection. We know that when we see the bodies are laid into the ground, we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's a mystery. But not to us. Because we have, we have dispensed telling others about how Christ took the riddle out of life and out of the future. So we are stewards of this as Christians. We have this precious truth that without that we don't have any life, we don't have any hope. And then the third qualifications for, for ministers and really for all Christians is to be faithful. It says it is required that those who have been given, given a stewardship or trust must prove faithful. What's the Lord asking us to do? Just carry out his orders. Just carry out his orders. You know, God does not require you to be successful. God does not require you to be successful. What he requires from us is to be faithful. Somebody once said, I heard a priest said, God wants fat Christians. <laughs> Faithful, available, and teachable. He wants us to be fat in that we're faithful. Number one, we need to be faithful. We need to be available. That means when he says move, we move. And then teachable. We don't know everything, do we? Oh, some of us know that we don't know everything because we think we know everything, and every time we think we know everything, we learn that we don't know anything. I'm not going to say that again. The Lord says to us, be faithful. Don't volunteer for something and then not perform. Don't start something and then not finish. Don't ride on enthusiasm and then fall on commitment. So many things are begun on enthusiasm. God wants commitment. We're blessed to live so, so, so close. And actually, Andrew and I have talked about this. We are blessed to live so close to some, some very historic things that have happened in our nation. Some landmarks, some really neat things. And one of those things that we really look close to is, is uh, the Arlington National Cemetery. And in Arlington National Cemetery, we have what, what is called the, the Tomb of the Unknown. Everybody knows it as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And what an impressive sight. If, if, you've ever, if you ever get a chance to go down, go down there and 
During the summertime, they changed the guard every half hour. During the wintertime, they're there every hour to change the guard. It's impressive. It is all. It's just a. It's solemn. It's. It, it's just incredible. And before the before the the the, the changing of the guard. The, the regiment that they have is, is very strict. And there's an inspection that is, that is very detailed. I mean, you can't have one little piece of anything, thread, anywhere on your uniform. And they go out there and they, it's, it's, you know, 21 steps across. It's a turn, it's like seconds. It's all precision. Where they place the rifle on their shoulder is, is, is meaningful. As a matter of fact, they always keep it out whenever they, they turn in front of the, the monument there, the tomb. The, the rifle is always on the outside, away from the tomb, as a way of saying, that they are there guarding that tomb from any outsider. So when you watch it, you, the rifle is always on the shoulder that is closest to you. Real, it, it's it's incredible. It's really neat. I say all that to say this. This is a matter of honor. There, they are there all the time. Twenty four seven, three hundred and sixty five days out of the year. They're there in blizzards. They are there in, in hurricanes. They are there, and, and they do this 24 hours a day. That means in one day, they, there's a changing of the guard in the wintertime 24 times. They do it every hour. Very strict and disciplined. Like I said, it's, it's, it's awe-inspiring. But here's the thing. Even when there's nobody there watching them, they do the exact same thing. They have this map that they walk on, this black path. And it's it's their, their cadence is in like they, they get from one end to the other end in exactly 90 seconds. Even if nobody's there. It's not like they go, oh, I don't have an audience, so I'm just going to stand here. Oh, here comes somebody. No. They do this no matter what. They have been found faithful. It's very, very difficult to become one of the, the guards that uh, guard the tomb of the unknown soldier. By the way, there is a, 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 the remains of somebody from World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, or the Korean War, there was somebody that was there from the, Viet the, the, the war in Vietnam, but they identified the remains and they removed the remains and said, we're going to keep them that empty in honor of those because there were so many who went missing <coughs> in Vietnam. So they did that. So I, if you ever get a chance to go down, and I just, I just mean this, it's, I know it's a long work around here. But we need to be that faithful even when nobody's watching us. Even when we don't think that our friends and our families see. We need to make sure that we are going through the disciplines in our life of prayer and fasting and reading God's Word. Amen? And that's what Paul is saying here in the scripture. Even when there's no one to see your labor of Christ, there's, that's where faithfulness comes through. 
doing it when nobody else is watching. The teacher of the word of God does not get truth from a majority vote of a congregation. Amen. Truth is not voted upon in this congregation. It comes from God's word. We don't stay away from sensitive issues because we might lose some people. Amen. 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 If it's truth, it's truth. One of the marks, though, of growing in maturity in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ is beginning to, beginning to be willing to stand out and be obedient to Christ. Even if some of your friends think that you're just a little bit too far out there. It's developing this kind of Christ character that says, Lord, you're the captain and I am the under rower. I get my agenda for life. I get my orders. I get my directions from you. And that brings me to why I'm up here this morning. First of all, I want to apologize to my wife. It's been four months since we've gotten this. And for some reason or another, we just kept not getting it scheduled. So I want to apologize to you, honey, for not scheduling it before. See, my wife, Tina, a few years ago, well, it's probably been longer than that, but you've been struggling with some things that God has been speaking to her about. And she finally said yes a couple years ago and started the process of uh, becoming credentialed, a credentialed minister in the Assemblies of God. And... Um, I mean, believe me, she's, she's been through the thick and things of ministry, the thick and thins of ministry ever since we've known each other. As a matter of fact, just so you all know, December 5th, we will be celebrating our 30th anniversary of our first date. Okay? Yes. So, um, that's why I know that our children's thing isn't on December the 5th, it's on December the 6th. But anyway, so December the 5th is our anniversary of our first date. So, you know, we've, we've been through a lot together, and I thank the Lord for her. Um, so I'm going to ask her to come up here. Amen. I'm excitedly proud of her. The reality is that in many respects, she puts me to shame. In many respects, I see the discipline in her life that she has. None of you know how early she gets up in the morning and does devotional. Okay. She's an encouragement to me. And she challenges me. This is this is what she does. I'm gonna cry here. <laughs> this is what she does. When she gets up in the morning, she has these these notebooks, these spiral bound notebooks that she has, and she literally writes out the word of God every morning. I mean, you know, it's one thing to read them. It's another thing to write out the Word of God. Try it sometime. It's, a, it, it, it's amazing. I am amazed at what God has done through my wife in the last three years of her going through this whole thing. Um, so with that, she keeps me humble. And I thank the Lord for that. Uh, many years ago, 
Uh, we were headed home after church, and what I thought was a great sermon, and I said to her, I wonder how many great preachers there are in the world, and Tina said to me, one less than you think. I'll let that sink in. She said she did. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, with this, the, uh, the Potomac District has asked us to do this in a, a setting like this. And this is a charge to you, a credential in charge. And this is what it says. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardships. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And that comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 through 5. With that, the vow of ministry is this. Do you solemnly pledge to give yourself unreservedly to the ministry and to live as a vessel chosen of God to lead people from darkness to light? Will you uphold the name of the Lord before the world, living a life that is becoming to you high and holy? that is becoming of your high and holy calling? Will you love and defend God's people so as to bring unity and blessing, giving special regard to holding your ministerial brethren in high esteem? Will you give yourself to prayer and to study and the preaching of God's word? If so, please answer yes, with God's help I will. This is what I'd like to do. I think we're going to come down here. And I would like to have my deacon board come up. Amen. Deacons come up. Sister Sandy is teaching. I'll take it over. Thank you. Pray for uh, Brother Tom. Um, I know that he had to go home and take care of Dot. So just be in prayer for, for Dot Lizzie. It's okay. Amen. Amen. Now I would like to have the rest of our family up here. And we're just going to pray for Tina. Amen. And, and all of you, if you could just reach out your hand. Once. You can get closer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you and I praise you, Lord God. Lord, I thank you for this woman that you have placed in my life. I thank you, Lord God, that you have made her my wife. And Father, the, the blessing that she is to me, Lord. And I lift her up, Lord God, not only as, as a pastor of this church, but especially, Lord God, as her husband. And we just pray, Lord God, that you would anoint her, Lord, in, in a special way, Lord God. Just use her for your glory, Lord. Father, we pray that as she studies and as she uh, does her devotional, Lord God, and as she prays, Lord, that you would just see her grow, Lord God, in you and her relationship with you, Lord God. 
so that others may know through that that Lord God you have anointed her show your your grace and your mercy through her Lord God and our Father we just pray that you would just do this uh, in the name of Jesus Lord God encourage her in all things Lord God in the name of Jesus as, as we Father, as a church, we just uh, set her forth, Lord God, in this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go away. Amen. Of course, of course now... Um, you know, she, she, she has been this for a while. Actually, officially, since June 6th. Now, I didn't get this until July 27th. So, anyway, so officially since June 6th, she, she is Reverend Tina Powell, so she doesn't like that term. Okay, so you'll never see her sign that name. Like Amen. And this this uh, this certification says ministry license. The general counsel of the Assemblies of God, Springfield, Missouri. This is to certify that Tina M. Powis have have been given evidence of the, a divine calling to the ministry and having attained to the scriptural standards prescribed by the general counsel of the Assemblies of God and the approval of the prosperity of the Potomac District Council is hereby given a ministry license and authorization to perform all essential functions of pastoral or other ministerial work subject to the laws of the state. This recognition as a licensed minister is prayerfully granted invoking the divine presence with blessing and power and is, is valid as long as Fellowship with the Assemblies of God and a godly life and scriptural standard of teaching are maintained, confirmed by influence of the of a current annual fellowship card. Get ready to do that. Given this sixth day of June, the year of our Lord, 2017, it's signed by George O. Wood, General Superintendent, and James Bradford, our General Secretary. So I thank the Lord for a godly wife. Amen. Um, she has definitely made my life in ministry so much better. Her encouragement and her dedication and her love for you yes. is really inspiring to me. And um, I just thank the Lord for her. Amen. Amen. So let's stand and we'll be dismissed. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for each person that is here. And I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity, Lord, to speak your word into the lives of your people. I thank you, Lord, for what you have done in the life of my wife and how you have called her and encouraged her. And Lord, how you have set her apart. And I pray, Lord God, that you would continue to move in and through her. And Father, as we are dismissed from this service, Lord, I pray that we would all be those stewards of the mysteries of God. That we would proclaim, Lord, your word in this world that is really dark. And help us to be your light. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.